Hello. Um, first up, thank you for coming in, because it was a heavy night last night for a lot of people, so I really appreciate the people are in the room. And if you do drift off during it, that's okay, because I'm really jet-lagged and I've got to try and stay awake as it is. So what I wanted to talk about today was kind of talk about a uh, little bit of our journey and our preoccupations as a studio and kind of show how that, um, how our games have developed, where we're going next and, and how we've kind of hopefully found some stuff that we think is kind of interesting for other people along the way. So um, I'm going to start off with really talking about the kind of the origins of, of, of where I come from, where the studio come from and how that's um, put us into a, a, a quite a, a different kind of mindset. Um, and to do this, I'm going to very, very quickly do a kind of like a potted, mega-fast history of the first-person shooter, which is basically my obsession. And potentially quite strangely for the studio that made Dear Esther, which is a very, very slow and uh, has a distinct lack of zombies and shotguns, um, this, this kind of obsession with first-person shooters very much drives everything that we, we, we do as developers. So this story begins um, when I got a job um, at a university teaching effectively, kind of like teaching stuff like Photoshop and, and 3DS Max. But as part of that job, they threw a sweetener in it, which was they let you do a PhD. And the PhD I thought I was going to do was going to be on presence, which is kind of a psychological term similar to immersion. And it's the extent to which people lose themselves in virtual realities and cease to be able to distinguish between the inputs from the real world and the virtual world. And I was really into this, and I thought this is great. And I thought, particularly as a writer, what's really interesting is how really, really simple um, media with very, very low fidelity can create that incredible sense of immersion. It's called the, uh, the book problem in, in VR research. So I was looking at how you could use story to manipulate players' psychologies to help them engage at a deeper level with, with virtual realities. And I was doing this for a little while and realized that I was going to have to actually build a virtual reality at some point. And I'm really not that technical, and this struck me as absolutely terrifying. Until I just was having, had a bit of a eureka moment sitting down one day when I thought, but there are already mass market virtual realities out there that have been using story to manipulate player immersion and emotion involvement for kind of quite a long time. In fact, going back to 1976 when Mazewell popped out and they're called first person shooters. And really, since the kind of the, the, the genre really kind of kicked off in the early 90s, this is wonderful to the colony, which is like pre Wolfenstein kind of a Mac game. Um, this idea of using kind of a, a story and that, that very, very significant direct perceptual mapping between the player and the avatar to create an incredibly strong sense of immersion has been, has been going around for quite some time. Now, I think personally that um, first-person shooters tend to get very maligned in terms of they're, they're often the genre that is picked up as the one which represents everything that's base, shallow, and uh, I don't know why. Um, but particularly the one which kind of gets me is that, is that they're all the same. And actually, this isn't true. Um, so what I did was uh, I did this PhD, and I looked at first-person shooters. And I realized that actually we didn't know very much about first-person shooters because we didn't have baseline data about them. And what we really needed to do was accumulate an awful lot of raw data about them, and particularly about stories. So I played an enormous number of shooters over four and a half years and made very, very, very long anal retentive notes, like things, how many NPCs do they have? How many guns do they have? How many, what's the average ammo clip per gun in a shooter? How the levels join together? Do you tend to sort of go in one location like Half-Life 2 and you follow it right through to a citadel? Is it like Deus Ex where you hop around the world and the levels don't relate to each other? And all this kind of information just seemed to be hugely important and actually missing from, from our understandings. Going through that, one of the things which really came out of it was that there actually is a very, very structured diversification of the genre that we can see on. And what we can see in the first-person shooter is we can see two things happening. We can see these sub-genres emerge. We can see the kind of emergence of the, of the RPG first person, which is kind of the, the roots of games like Skyrim and things like that. But this actually goes right back to the, the kind of inception, where actually an awful lot of first person technologies are RPG technologies. Pre-Wolfenstein, first person was mainly found in RPG games and at a much reduced speed. Um, so we have that kind of all the way through. What we happen on the other side of it is we do have kind of games which tend to be much more driven by arcade, and that's kind of the other parent of the first person shooter is the arcade game. In these games, we have a very, very stripped down, very simple gameplay. And what's really interesting about that is that we have a genre which not only is probably, did, could, could be kind of seen as, as having a great deal to do with spawning the indie scene in itself, as well as kind of creating probably half the, develop, half the developers that we know on the map because of the opening out of, of engine tools. But also, because of the limited amount of, of, of gameplay mechanics which are in there to try and protect the arcade experience, what we tend to find is that actually, quite a lot of investment is placed into the world spinning which goes in in these games. It was really, really interesting. I've, I've just finished writing a book on Doom and I was very lucky and got to go and interview John Carmack as part of it. And when I was interviewing him, he sat there and he said something which completely stopped me in my tracks where he said, Id, we're not really that interested in gameplay. 
what we really, really love a world. And I'm just sitting there thinking, wow, that's, that's kind of the last person I expected to say that. But actually, if you look at the way that an awful lot of FPSs work, the investment is very, very heavily on the world. And we can see this kind of like this, this, this beginning of this formalization that goes on as developers learn from it and the, the genre evolves and it really, really focuses and tightens down what are the really effective ways in which you can use story and world spinning and content to adjust and manipulate the player experience. Because what's really interesting about first person shooters is that when we actually look at what are seen as the, the, the majorly effective ones, the real kind of like heavy hitters, the ones which are seen as classics, if we remove the kind of multiplayer side altogether and we take away things like Team Fortress and, and, and kind of games which are simply focused on that kind of competitive sport angle and we look at single player first person shooters, what distinguishes those single player first person shooters is very rarely innovative mechanics. You might have games like Singularity, you do have the kind of the innovation in mechanics with games like Portal and with Cube, but actually mostly what's going on with the ones that are seen as classics is that they're very, very, very good at world spinning and sucking you in through the content, which should actually run against the received wisdom of why first-person shooter works, where when you talk to the sort of received wisdom about first-person shooters is that content, story, world spinning is absolutely immaterial, no one gives a damn about it, it's all just about guns and about that very simple arcade experience. That doesn't actually appear to be true when you look at them in great numbers. And certainly when you kind of do that and you start seeing the differentiation between a kind of a mediocre shooter and a really, really good shooter, it comes down again and again and again to the quality of the story, the understanding of how story is used as a gameplay mechanic, and the understanding of how manipulating those kind of elements can help the player to have a much more engaged, immersed experience. So, this was great, this was, this was brilliant, and it's really exciting for me, because this actually kind of played very much into, into the kind of the instinct I had when I started doing it. And we had this kind of assembled bunch of baseline data as well, where we could say, well actually we can start saying things like, Halo is a more typical first person shooter than Deus Ex, because the way in which level structuring works in Halo is more typical, it's what we call bridging levels where the levels geographically are linked together as opposed to being um, distributed. Which then you go back and you ask the question and you say why might that be? What's the strength of bridging levels as opposed to having distributed levels? And when you start actually understanding that you can actually percentage up a whole genre like that and look at it in those ways, then you can start understanding specifically how story functions as a gameplay device in terms of enabling the player experience. And you can do it not in a way that's necessarily interpretive, where you're trying to say, well, I think it's because Half-Life's kind of Eastern European city is really good because no one had really seen stuff like that before. And you can start saying things like, these games should work because they bridge and that's powerful and that works in this way. They've got the right number of weapons in the weapon set. Um, the relationship between the number of weapons that are there and the number of total affordances that the player has when they're playing through the game is right. And it gives us a way of almost mechanically talking about gameplay and story. So the other thing that was happening while this was, while this was going on is that my kind of like passion for first person games was going through the roof as well as sort of rediscovering. And the more I played, the more respect I had for developers that are doing it. And even those ones which again get very, very, very often maligned, um, like the Call of Duties, you really kind of begin to get respect for how well crafted they are. What was really interesting though, is that there were two sort of things going on within, within the PhD. So within the PhD itself, there was this, this question of having to go through and synthesize everything that was going on and producing lots of tables like this where we said, well, what types of worlds do we find? And one of the things that tends to happen is that lots of games start off fairly normal and then very rapidly push towards the fantastical. And that's an incredibly powerful device for managing player expectation because you say to the player in the early sections of the game, you can trust this game, you, if you can bring your understanding, say, of physics from the real world, you can put that into this game. You can bring your understanding of real world geopolitics and you can put them into this game. Which is, an, you know, we, we talk about having to train players all the time in the first sections of games. And one of the things which games do a lot of times, they assume that you can import both cultural and sort of physical knowledge about the world into that sphere. Then games almost certainly sorry, almost inevitably then push beyond that into a more fantastical space. And that's not just about the kind of thing of the narrative journey of saying, then we introduce a crisis that must be resolved and that's how narrative works. It does something more fundamental than that. It says all of those systems, and all of that understanding which you've imported from the real world into that game, you can have all that, but it doesn't quite work like that and we're gonna dictate the terms in which it differs. And that sets up a contract with the player that if they trust you and if they accept your version of those events, they can still have that real world imported knowledge, but also you can start manipulating reality in a way which best serves gameplay. Um, and there are things like simplifying social structures within that, which means that you can actually support the fact that it's very difficult to say have complex social AI in terms of, of the costs that, that go alongside that. 
So it's not just about a story thing. It's about a direct kind of uh, psychological contract with the player which enables them to kind of manage their uh, interpretation of what's going on. So there was an awful lot of this kind of stuff, looking at this and kind of saying, how do the environments relate to the story episodes? Do we have direct mapping? Are the names of the episodes the names of the actual places where you are? What is it multi-directional? How many environment sets do you have? And do these things relate to stuff like Miller's magic number seven, like when you can only supposedly hold seven things in your short-term memory at the same time? Do we find sort of like evidence that not through a kind of an academic process, but through an evolution of a genre, actually what we're seeing is we're seeing a genre come down to reaching those points which are optimized for the type of play which uh, is going on. Um, and so, yes, lots of more stuff like this. Um, one of the other things which came out of it was, was looking at the way in which representation worked. And this kind of like was driven initially by looking at characters, and I was looking at Strog in Quake, and from that looking at kind of zombies. And this related to AI as well, because a zombie can have very, very simple AI and have behavior which you will readily accept. It just has to basically moan, shuffle about, and try and eat your brains. You don't have to do more than that. It's much harder to have a more complex psychology and represent it in a right way. So the way in which a world is spun can have a direct manipulative effect on the player itself in terms of setting up their framework of expectations and interpretation. This all seemed really, really interesting. And at the same time, I was looking at a lot of games like Stalker and Metro, which have these phenomenal atmospheres and going, well, do you know what? I'm playing a lot of these games for the atmospheres for the world spinning. And that just leads to a really, really simple question, which is, well, would that be enough? Because it kind of feels like enough, and these games have enough blank patches in them that you don't immediately turn off the game in. So how do we find out if actually you could pretty much get rid of all the gameplay and just leave a world and just leave a, a, a story that was crafted? Would that be enough to hold the player's attention? The problem is... That's a question which it's impossible to answer theoretically. And alongside another couple of questions, I kind of reached a point where I was going, there's just no way of doing anything other than theorizing about this. But actually what we want to do is to be able to get something which is closer to an answer. And we also want to do something that breaks out of the ivory tower and actually is producing results which people in the games industry and people in the gaming community can understand because they don't have to deal with academic theory. We can just present results to them and say, look, this works or it doesn't, or you can take ideas from this. How are you going to do that? You're going to make games, which is incidentally a whole lot more fun than doing academic PhDs. <laughs> so we made a studio. Um, it's that one. We started off as a mod team. We did a few mods. And basically, all the, the, everything we did was we went, we're going to take more or less a single question, and we're going to find a question that's really, really interesting to us that has come up from the research that we don't think can be adequately answered theoretically, and we're just going to see if we can make it work. We're going to accept the fact that that is really shoddy academic data. We're going to accept the fact that if we just do it badly, that's going to invalidate the data we get. It's very, very high risk. But if it works, we actually have something that we can just point people outside academia at and say, look, tried that. We think this is a good direction to go in. Um, and that was moderately successful. And, and one of the one games that we did um, was really, really very successful. And it was a bit of an accident, because I actually thought it would be the, the worst game we made. We made um, a game called Dear Esther at the end of the period of research, when we had a research grant to make these mods, which I still couldn't believe that I'd gone to a research council and gone, will you help us make some first-person shooters for academic research? And they went, yeah, great, have £70,000. It was like, it's great. Um, we'd run out of money when we made Esther. We couldn't afford anything. So we were looking at, out of the questions that we had left, what was a cheap question to answer? And the one that basically said, can we remove gameplay and just leave a world, struck me as being a particularly cheap question to answer because we didn't need an awful lot of assets to do it. We could have a very empty environment. Um, and these converging factors came together around it. This idea of saying, can you remove everything apart from the, uh, the world itself and the story that's being spun in that world, will that be rewarding to players? Um, I was really interested at the same time, this idea of kind of ambiguity and saying, well, can we then have something which is very fractured, which doesn't make sense, which doesn't really add up, something that is more like a William Burroughs kind of cut up? Um, I was hugely kind of like, a, a, and still am, take a lot of inspiration from the, uh, the Eastern European development scene, first-person shooters, particularly people like 4A and um, what was GSC and now is Vostok and Ice Pick Lodge. Um, and that idea of actually that kind of thing of, of, of really investing a huge amount of time in the emotional landscape of the... Of the, the um, the worlds which are spun in their games, not just as backdrops to actions, not just as kind of like a set piece for arenas to happen in, but as fully crafted, emotionally realized worlds. And the other thing which came into it is uh, this, this, this notion of, of cellar door, which is um, 
allegedly one of the most beautiful words in the English language. And it's picked up, I remember watching Donnie Darko about the time, there's a point where Donnie's teacher says, Salador, just in itself, as a sound, is the most beautiful sound you can make in the English language. And this was really kind of inspirational as well, of going, well, is it okay to just produce something beautiful? And does that have a power? Is that still, can the beauty be part of the message? Can the beauty be part of what we do in itself? And there was a phrase from, I'm a, a big Faith No More fan, from the start of a song in a little intro, we're at the back of it, the um, Chuck, the singer at the time, just says, Dear Esther, as if they're starting a letter. And I thought, that's a really beautiful sounding phrase. That's it, we're going to use that. And that was it. There was no more kind of stuff around it other than that phrase is beautiful and that phrase is enigmatic. And just the sound of those words starts you thinking. And the more you say it, the more they kind of seem to kind of, I got very, very kind of deeply involved in just the sound of them. Can we take that principle and build a world on that principle as well? And we did. And um, made it as a mod. It did very well as a mod. Turned around, remade it again as a commercial game a few years later. And, and it um, kind of, as they say, the rest is history. It's done really, really well. What's interesting about Dear Esther, I think, is this relationship between kind of emptiness, emotional involvement, and this idea of, of, of beauty, of a simple representation of a space which is very beautiful and very quiet. And the kind of inevitable power that you get from that in terms of creating a reflective experience, in the same way that if you look at something like a Mark Rothko painting, the more time you spend in front of it, even though it's ostensibly incredibly simplistic, it unlocks, it just helps you create an interpretive, reflective space. What they're doing is they're constructing an architecture for you to feel in. And it kind of struck me and still kind of uh, strikes me with, with the, the best of these kind of games. And whether they are very, very traditional, very mainstream, whether they're very, very experimental, it's this idea of creating a space that enables you to be able to feel efficiently within it um, is really where it's kind of going. Um, and with Esther, in a way, that was quite a simple proposition because there's a very kind of an aspiration for a very deep emotional commitment to it, but actually the emotions themselves are not enormously complex. They're just very different for a game. So you have a very deep emotional uh, reaction to it, but there's not a great deal of, uh, of, of scope in it. In a weird kind of tangential way, it's kind of similar to all the criticisms which normal first-person shooters get of being incredibly emotionally shallow. They're not incredibly emotionally shallow, they just have a very, very narrow emotional range that they, they evoke in you. Dear Esther evokes a similarly small emotional range. Um, so it's just a kind of a, an interesting counterpart. Um, but alongside this, we kind of didn't want to stop there. We wanted to, to keep kind of uh, looking at this and kind of saying, okay, well, what can we do in terms of the type of emotional journeys we can get players to have? Can we do stuff which is, has slightly more scope and diversity? And can we now start saying, if we know it's possible to be very, very successful at creating this kind of, uh, this emotional engagement with the player in a pure story space, what happens if we start throwing gameplay back into it? Can we still manage that kind of complexity of emotional journey? And so we, we made a, a, a survival horror mod called Corsacovia, and this was around being developed at the same time as the Dear Esther remake was going on. And it wasn't, broadly speaking, particularly successful. Um, but one of my things about um, academics making games that I always bang on about to anyone that listen is the bonus about making games an academic is that your structures for success and failure are very different from people working in industry, whether they're independent or whether they're working in the studio system. If you're working in industry, you have a very simple success or failure rate, which is you stay in business or you don't. If you're an academic, you can fail horrifically, make a complete balls up of what you're doing, but provided you do it in an interesting way, and provided that failure generates interesting data, that's a success. So it's one of the reasons why I still think academics can contribute to industry in a big way, because they can do stupid things, take massive risks, fail horribly, and at the very least industry, you'll be able to say, not doing that, because they really made an arse up of that, and it's just a bad idea. Um, and less people go out of business, and that's good for everyone. Um, Corsicovia, what we were interested in was extremes. And we wanted to say, particularly with horror games, horror games aren't scary. Horror games aren't scary because we know exactly what to expect. Because they've solidified so much, they're victims of their own success in a lot of ways. That They've got it, they've nailed it so much that we just know exactly what's going on. The other issue with horror games is if you're working for a publisher, you've got this very weird situation where you can't actually make it too horrible because then you start doing things that publishers might not like. And we'll come back to that when we start talking about a machine for pigs in, in just a minute. So we wanted to push it. We wanted to break every single golden rule we could find. We're going to frustrate the player. We're going to muck around with physics. We're going to chop things up. We're going to um, have a very dodgy kind of like pacing curve. We're going to have enemies that are just big black balls of smoke, so you can't apply your anthro 
anthropomorphic knowledge to it, which we normally do with AIs when we look at which way they're facing, we project our own behaviours onto them to supplement their actual behaviours. What if we take all that stuff away and just leave the player really very stranded in a space that doesn't make sense? And then on top of that, we layer a story which absolutely doesn't make any sense and is absolutely disgusting and horrible and very, very sick and very twisted and upsetting about a man who eats his own eyeballs. Um, and what was really interesting about Corsicovia is that it, it, it failed in a lot of ways, primarily because I made some really, really awful design decisions in there. And we made it for too little money in too short a space of time. We didn't test it properly, and it wrecked quite a lot of the stuff that we tried to do. What we did find, though, was that players were having incredibly extreme emotional reactions to it. That if they got it, if they were prepared to go past the flaws in the gameplay, because it was pushing so much further than any other horror game, people were completely going, um, having incredibly strong emotional reactions to it, really engaging with the characters, which is kind of interesting given that the main character that's in it is, has a thing called Korsakoff syndrome where you can't retain long-term memory, you can't make new memories, and you can't distinguish between fantasy and reality, and has eaten his own eyeballs because he thinks he's turned into God and he's destroyed the world. Not an easy character to sympathise with, but actually we were finding players were sympathising and empathising with him, primarily because they were pushed by the kind of shock tactics of the game into a place where they were quite emotionally vulnerable. And it meant that they were happy to engage. And that wasn't just a way of saying, great, we've got them, and now we can basically mug them emotionally. But there's a really interesting thing there. When you can knock people out of their comfort zone one way or another, you can have quite a deep relationship with them as a game developer. And that was really interesting. And it was tantalizing how close we were and how if we'd only done it right, then um, we could have done something really quite exceptional. Um, the thing was, at the same time as we were making that, someone was doing it right. Because frictional games were making Amnesia the Dark Descent, which did an awful lot of the things we tried to do with Corsicovia, but did them really, really, really well. So they took really kind of innovative ideas like, in a horror game, if you actually die, it's no longer scary. So if you want to make a scary horror game, you have to make sure you never kill the player. So you have to have things like AI, which actually turns away from the player when it gets too close to them so it can't find them. What about if we make a horror game where actually we reverse the trend of Resident Evil and make sure you can't kill anything? So you're always helpless, you're always powerless. What if we try and flip around the way in which kind of like heroics normally work in horror games and we do the thing where we actually make the hero the anti-hero, but we push what they're doing as an anti-hero to quite an uncomfortable level where when we kind of drop the bomb on you of what the hero has done, you've already associated so strongly with the hero that you kind of feel disgusted with yourself and don't want to push on with the game. It's a really, really smart things. Um, and I thought it was amazing. I thought it was actually stunning, staggering game. It's, it's still one of the most frightening games that's been made. But it's so simple. And even when we know the tricks, it works. And that, to me, is that's the marker of a great game. When you know exactly how it works, and it still works. And the knowledge of how it works and what's going on under the bonnet in no way diminishes your experience. And if anything, kind of enhances the experience. Um, Frictional contacted us in, um, uh, at GDCE last year and said, look, we're working on a new game and we know what you're interested in. We know that you're primarily driven by atmospherics, emotional involvement, and you're really interested in actually pushing things a little bit and uh, trying to get those quite extreme reactions from players and stuff like that. And we really, really like Dear Esther. We've been, we're making another game. We're overhauling the engine. We've got probably like two or three years when we're not going to have a product out. What do you say? Do you want to make Amnesia sequel? And we said yes, because it would be really stupid not to. Um, and it's been huge amounts of fun. So. I think the reason that I kind of wanted to quickly go through Corsicovia into a machine for pigs is that the stuff which we're trying to do with pigs, it gives us not only a chance to kind of redeem ourselves and do right what we did wrong in Corsicovia, but trying to also look for ways to kind of take that, continue that kind of process of saying, how do you create an architecture for people to feel effectively in? How do we enable the player to have a really strong emotional reaction, really strong emotional investment in this game? And how do we kind of do that within the confines of something which is ostensibly on the surface of a traditional horror game? And this was really interesting that uh, this came up at the panel yesterday when I think it was uh, Genova Chen said, you've got to enable the player to engage at multiple levels. So on one level, Amnesia and Machine for Pigs has to be a pulp horror story that you can just run through and scare yourself stupid. What we also wanted to do was to push some quite serious political themes in it. It's set in Victorian England. So this is a really quite amazing period of history where you have kind of unparalleled probably up until the, the development of the internet, kind of technological development going on, enormous social upheaval, um, phenomenal kind of innovation going on. But you have this horrendous kind of underbelly to that, where it's a time of just of mass poverty, of appalling kind of um, social inequality, uh, 
terrible kind of um, lack of social justice, where you'll have people that are, you know, inventing the centrifuge and steam engines, but they have an ashtray on their table, which is the hollowed out skull of a Papua New Guinean that they bought on the black market because they don't see it as being properly human. So there's something really vital and exciting in terms of, of, of a, a, a really deep story in there for us. And one of the things that we've been trying to explore within that is saying, how can we kind of go one step further than amnesia? How can we kind of do that thing of saying, how can we make you emotionally invest in a repellent character that you then can't get away from? How do we have a world that simultaneously pushes you away and draws you in? And so like things like, we've gone back to this idea of, of, of the cellar door, of the dear Esther, of the beauty, of saying, we know one of the things that we can do with the game world is suck people in if it's beautiful. How do we make this world so beautiful that you're constantly torn between not wanting to go forwards, but you have this incredible visual payoff and reward all the time, that the environments that you're seeing, which you're not seeing because it's far too light in here to show you a horror game, which is very dark. Let's find a light slide. No, that's useless. No, look at that, as you can just see the grill there, the lid. Um, how do we have the player in a situation where they're scared to go forwards not just because they think there's a monster there, but they're scared of what they might uncover about the world, what the sort of the, how deep does this kind of this very bleak, dark place go. But it's so beautiful that they're really pulled to go forward as well because they want to see it. And then we get them into a similar kind of political state that it feels like Victorian culture was in at the time, where it was obsessed with going forwards because it was so exciting. But the act of going forwards inevitably sort of pulled in some very, very unpleasant stuff within it. And do you ignore that? Do you, do you engage with that? How do you kind of make that work? And alongside this as well, we really, really wanted to push it and say, you know, that a horror game is, or any kind of like horror really, is usually at its most scary when there is a personalized vulnerability in it of either you, which is a classic way of doing it, you feel scared for yourself, but it struck me that actually you feeling scared for yourself is quite a simplistic and quite a shallow thing to do, and it's very easy to lose a player. What if you make the player scared for someone else? Being scared that something bad is happening to someone you love is really, really, really frightening. And I think sort of being a, a, a parent particularly, I don't really kind of like feel the fear. If something bad happens to me, you kind of go, that would happen to me. The prospect of something bad happening to my child is absolutely heart-wrenchingly, spine-crushingly terrifying. Can we find a way of making a personalizing this horror as well? So we have this dual scale of enormous epicness going on up here and very, very localized kind of uh, emotional responses down there. And can we bounce the player between those two places as we're bouncing the player backwards and forwards between beauty and horror, as we're bouncing the player between the kind of the wonder of innovation and this burgeoning science and the awfulness of how that what was actually kind of resting on that. So, on one level, you have this very sort of like uh, kind of pulp, penny dreadful kind of Victorian horror game. But on the other level, what we're trying to do is for those players that in engage at that deeper emotional level, we're never trying to let them settle down. Where they can't at any point go, I understand now what's going on. I can take a position to this. The moment they do that, they can start shutting down. So every time we think we've got them, we have to constantly kick them back out of that and use these multiple strands of kind of plot and design to make sure they can't ever emotionally settle down and get comfortable which is really, really challenging. And fortunately, Friction have been making horror games for a long time, and they, they're very good at um, looking at our, our, the, the levels we send them and, and giving us kind of points to make that happen. But it's still part of the same process. How do we make people more emotionally involved with the games we do? How do we use this world spinning to help the player in that interpretive frame? Um, which leads very naturally onto the, the, the game that we've been making simultaneously, which um, can wholeheartedly recommend as possibly the worst thing you can do as a, as a small studio is make two games at once. Because um, it, it's, yeah, it's interesting. Um, around the same time we were, we were talking to Frictional, we were also, um, had just got some funding to do a prototype for what I kind of initially pitched as the kind of spiritual successor to Dear Esther. So when Esther came out, there were things in Esther that we couldn't do. We had, um, mainly because of the kind of, uh, the kind of budgetary constraints and stuff we were under. And mainly, I think, as well, because of conceptually how Esther was, was kind of thought of. Esther's a very linear experience. Esther is a very managed experience, even with this central ambiguity of the plot going on. And Esther's very ethereal. You don't really, you're very, very ghost-like in this world you're in. And we wanted to kind of look at all these things and kind of knock all these things on the head and say, well, actually, can we do something that is not linear, where you are much more grounded in the world, there is much more sense of dynamism and interactivity going on, so why don't we, 
in one of those kind of like brilliant things, which is why if you're a creative director, you need to have a good team to tell you to not be so ridiculous around you and have that team in place before you get the money and commit to making it. Why don't we make a bloody great open world game? Because obviously, as a small indie developer, open world gaming is a really successful thing to do. And let's make it really, really high fidelity. Let's use CryEngine. Let's make it the most beautiful indie game that's ever made. And let's make it a fully non-linear drama. So whatever the player does at any point in the game ever, they will still have a successful dramatic experience, no matter what choices they make. And yeah, at that point, no one was there to go, damn, that's a really stupid idea. Um, <laughs> So we committed to it. Um, so this is really interesting. This is really kind of challenging for me. And it's, it's, it's super exciting to do it. Because what we're kind of talking about here is we're almost kind of weirdly going around full circle to where we first started off. Because the only way to make this game work is if the player makes it work for us. The player has to be in a state where they start doing the work for us. They start making interpretations for us. They start generating their own emotional response to it. So, Effectively, what we're trying to do is create an architecture where the player can start generating their own game mechanics inside it. And by that, this kind of relates again to similar stuff that was being talked about yesterday in the experiential panel. When you are in a game world, when you're interpreting story, or when you're interpreting plot, or when you're just looking at things, or when you're listening to things, you are actively engaged in a feedback loop with the game. That is a game mechanic. If it's something that controls the experience in some way, or helps adapt the experience, or manage the experience, it's a mechanic, as far as I'm concerned. So story is a game mechanic, world is a game mechanic. We might not be able to have a situation where the player can start manufacturing their own physics-based mechanics. We can certainly have a situation where the player is so actively involved in interpretation and seeking out an exploration that they're effectively constantly generating and renewing the interpretive framework by which they engage with the game. If they begin doing that, and if we get them into that state where they are seeking meaning and significance, creating those hierarchies, actively trying to understand what an object might mean in a space, then the idea of actually making something that's non-linear but still has a very, very powerful dramatic art becomes viable. Because you don't have to have this situation which you normally have in open world games where it might be an open world game but you have linear quests threaded within that and they're most certainly not open world. And they rely on this idea that you grind through and you go next step and you move forward and you do something and then it delivers and you go over here and you do something and it delivers. Because what you're not being asked to do, and what you're not doing as a player, is having to actively process and understand the events that are happening in all the scenes. There's no ambiguity in it. And for me, this is like generally the kind of like the, the takeout that's, that's kind of, I think now is beginning to emerge as something that the more and more studios are learning. And it's something that's just come out of the indie sector and it's being looked at more by, by the, the traditional mainstream sector. But we should be banging that because I think we kind of really made the noise about that one. Um, if you introduce ambiguity into a game space, players pick that up and run with it. They just run with it, and they run with it, and they run with it. And the more ambiguity you go in, the more work they do. And then they become active players. They stop being button mashers, and they actively get involved. So if we know that we can have um, objects that might or might not have significance within a non-linear space, and if we provide a series of architectures, so where you go in the world, you'll have these hooks will appear that you can hang on those objects will change their meaning depending on which architecture you're operating within. So suddenly we've got a way of taking a non-linear world and having a dramatic interaction with that non-linear world which is powerful and emotional without having to have mass change in the world and without having to have linear threads because we're changing the player, we're not changing the world. So when that is supported by a world which is also kind of dynamic and responsive and we're looking at things like um, responsive weather, um, we have um, we're looking at seasons at the moment, we're looking at time manipulation, um, then when you have that level where the world can be interacted with and altered, but you also have this thing where you're actually making the player an active tool in changing the world. Because I think kind of the important thing is that the, um, the world doesn't exist in the game engine when you're playing a game. The world is, is what you take from the game engine and create in your head as a player. In a similar way to... Um, if you think you see something in a game engine, in a world, say you produce something, say you're using subliminals, we used to do subliminal stuff in Esther where there were figures appearing. People now see figures where there aren't figures. So we get emails from people going, oh, that figure in that place really scared me. And we know for a fact there isn't one there, but they created it. So for them, that figure exists, that asset exists. The fact that they created it, not us, doesn't mean that that asset doesn't exist. That asset absolutely exists because the game experience is in the mind of the player it's not on the disc, it's not on the system. So the way to make Rapture, we're kind of coming to, is to understand Rapture as a 
and architecture to try and create a certain type of emotional psychology in the player. And if we create the right type of emotional psychology in the player, then they will supplement everything we do, and we don't have to do everything in the engine. We just have to get them into a point where they're going to help us deliver the game. Which, I kind of go backwards and forwards between that being a really banal and trite thing to say, and that being a really kind of like up its own backside pretentious academic thing to say, and I'm kind of going like that. And I think probably just have to kind of accept that it probably is somewhere in the middle. But it's something that I think we can all do more of, that um, understanding this thing of, of, of saying, well, we have all these things we can make in a game engine. We have all these ways of kind of steering and changing the player experience. Um, but really, there's, there's only one tool that actually matters, and everything else is irrelevant. If the player isn't kind of brought to the center of your game design and your game development, and your player doesn't enter into that contract, and your player doesn't do that work and have that input and help you make the game, you're, you're gone, you haven't got it. It doesn't matter what else you throw at the game. If the player is not present, if the player is not investing, everything else is irrelevant. When we understand that, then that changes the way in which we look at game design, because then we start saying, actually, all we are in the business of doing is creating architectures for experience. That's all we do. And frankly, nothing else matters. So how do we do that? How do we create houses that players want to kind of live in and help build. You know, we give them a shell and they turn it into a home for the period of it, which I've just said that and now I'm going, it's the kind of thing that I'm gonna go, I should really say that? But I think there is a degree of truth in it. If players actually need to help us build the world which we present them, we're giving them Lego, we're giving them a bunch of stuff that they can use and put it together and we're providing them the kind of, uh, the tools and the understanding of, of, of how that might work. And those tools then really come down to very kind of simple things. It's playing around with ambiguity. It's playing around with making the player active and involved and implicated in the action that's going on. And these are not things that require complex mechanics to achieve. These are things that require a, a trust in your own vision, a respect for the player's emotional intelligence as well as kind of intellectual intelligence. The space and time for them to be able to engage in that process rather than kind of bombarding them with binary things that they have to achieve in order to go forwards. And these are lessons which kind of coming right back round in the loop, which are right there in the very, very, very early stages of SPF's development. That I find myself looking at this stuff with Rapture and going, wow, we're gonna do something really innovative and big here. And then I look at it and I go, no, we're not. We're iterating on a pattern which has been going for 30 years. Because Doom did this really, really, really well. System Shock did it phenomenally well. These games did it. They understood how to get that investment and how to make a player begin to create the game in collaboration with the developer. And there's a reason why 30 years later people are still doing it. So I guess that's kind of uh, what I want to say. The player is the game, and uh, we have to let them be the game. So that's it. Thank you. So alongside that, when um, Rich and I were talking, um, we thought it'd be really, really worth asking Michael Norrie from Taylor Tales to, to, to come up to the front and, and just have a bit of a kind of an informal chat as well and maybe throw it open to some questions and things like that. One of the things which, which um, you can't read, it's, it's like a serial killer's killer writing. <laughs> um, <coughs> one of the things which, which I guess the Chinese room, Taylor Tales, and a few other people have sort of actually been kind of involved in is what is very problematically described as the not game scene, which is a generally quite European orientated kind of subsector of the indie scene which from the outside is I guess geared around experiences which don't have traditional goal structures and mechanic structures within them. I have to point out that nobody I think in the not game scene likes the term not games and well, everyone hates it. It's only it. problematic for the reasons that the, word, that the phrase even exists. Is, I mean, it nev was never intended to be a, a category or a, or a label at all. It was just because, well, it exists because everybody kept saying it, you know? <laughs> That's not a game. Or, you know, reviews of certain games would start, well, it's not really a game, but, you know, or something like this. So we were just like, because after years, I mean, we exist since 2002, and for the longest time we insisted on calling everything we made games. And everybody was always giving a shit for it. And we were like, well, you know, you know, a few years ago, we were just like, okay, fine, it's not a game. And so we just started to like accept that and let other people accept that. And, and so it's problematic also, I'll just say and then I'll shut up, but that um, because of the reason why those games exist, 
because the games that are labeled not games are games that are um, either dealing with unpopular subject matter and unpopular format. They're made by you know small teams, sometimes quickly, sometimes they're like just about thoughts or poems or small things that people are obsessed with. And it's not um, what games usually are. So this is why the, the subject is, you know, if you're actually making a not game, you may not like the term, but you certainly like all of the concepts that are embraced within that, um, within that idea, which is really what it is. It's not re even important to even call it a not game. We were somewhat appalled when people called things not games, but <laughs> because we were just like, well, yeah. Well, and we like that sort of, you know, problematizing term hat that there is sort of a problem in there, you know, because there's a problem in games to us. So, yeah. I guess um, we were um, at GDC Europe um, two months ago. Yeah. And at the Indie Summit, it was really interesting. I don't know how many people, anybody at GDC Europe who's here. Hey, at the back. <laughs> what was really striking was that for an entire day, I guess about 12 speakers went up and one after the other with very, very, very different games. I mean, ranging from um, Rob, who's over in the fire station with international racing squirrels, board game designers, and everyone. And even though these games were radically different, everyone stood up and basically said the same thing in their conclusion. Mm -hmm. And it was all come down to emotional investment, player experience, everything else is disposable. If you don't get that right, you've got nothing. And it was really striking from having been over the last few years to a lot of indie summits where they've traditionally been quite mechanic driven and kind of like we did this cool thing with this mechanic and we tweaked it and it's going to go and actually suddenly a very diverse group of people are all standing there at one indie summit and saying do you know what it's about investment and that's kind of it and that's the be all and end all and that's not just not game makers that's kind of people that are making quite kind of I guess traditional yeah. indie games if there's such a thing and it was something I don't know how you like it? felt or feel about that because it just seemed like an interesting thing well, to bring up I wasn't at the, that particular summit. <laughs> I was. You were. Yeah. Um, so I, I can't confirm or deny that. <coughs> um, yeah, I, I think it, 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 it sort of illustrates, I think, what we're trying to do with not games. It's that we're not really um, necessarily trying to make something completely new, it's more like, um, it's a, I always think of it as a, as a, a method, uh, a design method. It's, it's, it's just another way of approaching making something with this medium. And it's a way that is more closely related to other older kinds of um, creation, artistic creation. Um, where you make something for somebody else and not because you happen to be holding a brush and standing in front of a canvas. You're not making an object, you're making something that somehow shares something with uh, somebody. Um, and I don't think games as such, you know, in the sort of formal sense, do that. Uh, games are something, or create context in which people can do things with each other but I think with a, a, a medium that the computer offered, a media, the medium of video games, you get something that is a lot more similar to a canvas and a brush. Um, and it's not so much about enabling people to do things with each other as it is about establishing some kind of relationship between the people who make something and the people who look at it and then extrapolating from that a sort of an idea of what is this society that we live in, what is this world. Um, so. And it's kind of sad that we had to say, you know, that we had to even say, we, you know, we, we don't make games or anything, but we were sort of pushed towards that kind of extreme status situation just because, I mean, for us it's obvious. You see this wonderful technology, make something, make whatever you want. And no, everybody's sitting there, no, you have to make a game, it has to be a game, it has to have rules, it has to have rules, you know, these things that ex have existed for thousands of years, we, we think it just doesn't make sense. This is a beautiful new technology, we can do things that artists have dreamt of forever and could never do. And, and no, you know, and then, yeah, we just couldn't stand it anymore that everybody insisted that we make games with this. So it's interesting that other people would share that, um, that idea. And I think that's just because of progress or I don't know, um, enough people have sort of 
thought about it at this point. I mean, when we first started making stuff in 2002, it was just, we were co just considered outlandish and a lot of the ideas that have come through, like let's make a first person shooter that's just about its atmosphere and it's got these world, you, you know, no one, everyone would have just laughed at you and, <laughs> you know, it actually would have just the been first thing we did. a mistake. Yeah, it was actually we the- We created a quake mod with both of us naked running around <laughs> yeah. without a gun. Without a gun, yeah, <laughs> it was pretty cool. But anyway, it's like, yeah, I think that now you, there's been enough um, sort of spread of these ideas that, yeah, indeed, you know, you get a situation where there's people getting up one after the other saying, hey, this is a beautiful medium, let's try and think of what else we can do with it, because either they're bored with what has gone before or they see the problems that have occurred in the games well, industry. Or, or, things or that want something else too. Want something else too. <laughs> or realize that indie development allows you to make something else too. And so, yeah. Now why this happened in Europe, I don't know, <laughs> you know. No, I guess that was kind of the interesting thing of, of kind yeah. of bringing it up because it was, it had such a different flavor to say the Indie Summit at GDC, at GDC this year. And it kind of, it made us kind of sit there and go, well this is, this is it feels like, is there a European community developing? Finally, because we're so far behind you, frankly. Well, yeah, see, but I, I never, I never, I never consider it to reason. be, yeah, but see, it's like you say behind, and I can understand why that's true, because the games industry is much smaller in Europe. I mean, even though Europe is pretty big, it's like, in terms of sales and, you know, in terms of impact yeah, or whatever. Yeah, but if you but think of this history yeah. as starting with CD-ROMs rather than, than, you know, more arcade -y kind of things, then there's a lot of European stuff. In yeah, that, in that it's context. not so much that it's less. I, what I mean is that in terms of active development or hype or whatever, it is a lot less. I mean, but I don't think that that's, that's a not just games. That's right, I know, but I don't th consider that to be a, a fault or something, you know, because it allows for people to think about games in a different way, I think, because it's not always about like this commercial aspect of success, success, success. It's more about the experiment uh, um, or, I mean, because you don't, you can get a game funded, you know, in an in a alternative way, you're already thinking about it in a different way. You know, either some governments have game funds or you can get arts funding or you can, you know, so you're already thinking about it in a different way. You're not thinking, oh, I have to make something and it has to sell X copies and it'll be sold to this audience, which, you know, isn't everyone's emphasis, but I'm just saying that in Europe, you often don't even have to start there. You can start from a whole different angle and, and that's interesting. I mean, even films are like that in Europe, you know? It's like there's wide diversity of film and you'll never see in the United States, you know? It's like, and these are all, um, yeah, you have to, in the, what I found is that people tend to start at a different place. And I think that's why there was a shared atmosphere. The, the question of subsidy is, a, is one which we probably don't yeah. have time to go into, but I think it's a really important one. Yeah.